I'm double fisting coffee and a mimosa right now because it's Sunday. The relaxation, the energy. <sighs> An equal balance that leaves me just as tired as I was before. Hello friends, Ginny D here, and today I'm gonna do a little bit of a chatty, get ready with me type video. So I'm doing a winter Ashling look today for my annual winter patron postcard. I like to do a special offer around the holidays where I will mail you a real physical postcard with a photo on the front, in this case this year, winter Ashling, and then on the back it will be personalized to your name and signed by me. And yes, I do mail internationally, so everybody is eligible. All you have to do is pledge $5 or more on my Patreon between December 16th and 23rd. I will put the link in the description in case you want to get your own postcard. I think most of us have been feeling pretty isolated this year, and in-person physical mail is something that a lot of us don't really receive anymore. So I just really like getting the chance to send these postcards so that you just have something nice waiting for you in your mailbox. So when I say winter Ashling, what am I talking about? Well, when I created Ashling, I had this idea, this very original idea all my own in my own brain that her hair would change colors with the seasons like the leaves of a tree. I did not realize this was already a mechanic that the fae Eladrin have. Eladrin? Is it Eladrin? The Eladrin. Eladrin. Todd Kenrick says Eladrin, we can trust him. But I have always been really into designing characters that have like flowers in their hair and like plants growing off their body. That's just like a vibe that I'm into. And when I talked about this in my intro video for Ashling, a lot of people asked me if she just went bald in the winter and no, she does not. I decided that in the winter, her hair would just become like a deep kind of blue-green, like an evergreen kind of green. And of course the plants that grow out of her hair normally, which are like flowers and, and like little leaves, become holly berries and holly leaves and maybe like some pine needles in the winter. I'm thinking about including some like little dead twigs in it maybe, we'll see how it looks. Anyway, it's been snowing here in Colorado for the last few weeks on and off, so I figured it was a good time to try out Winter Ashling and just just try dressing up as a different variation on her. I do plan on eventually putting together a full Winter Ashling costume, which will require me sewing a few different pieces, but that is not happening yet. But thankfully, winter in Colorado lasts through like March easily, so plenty of time. So what we're gonna do today is I am just going to put together a Winter Ashling look in terms of makeup and hair and all the little leaves and stuff. And while I do that, I'm gonna answer some questions that I got on Twitter. I asked you guys what you wanted to know either from Ashling's perspective or about Ashling as a character. This isn't scripted, so you know, it'll be probably pretty rambly and we'll just hang out together while I do makeup. Just recently, I looked at the document that I put together when I first created Ashling, and this was, I mean, at this point, this was probably almost two years ago. But I thought it was interesting to look back at what I initially imagined Ashling being like, and then the character she's actually developed into as I play her. The biggest difference, I think, is just that I wrote her based on her backstory to be like a little bit of an edgy loner, which I know is so cliche with D&D characters, but like she really did grow up as sort of an outcast. And it's like part of the lore of elves in this homebrew world that my DM has created that elves sort of like intentionally live on the fringes and, and with no comforts or luxuries. So I wrote Ashling to be like a very hardened character. And those of you who have seen me actually portray her in videos and stuff will see that that is not how she is now. But there are still remnants of that in the way that Ashling talks about herself. Like, one of the things that I thought was interesting, and I don't know that anybody but me would pick up on this, but in her interview with Augury, one of the things Ashling says is that she doesn't play well with others, that she's, that she's not friendly, basically. I'm not typically described as friendly. I work better alone anyway, or with my party, but that's a special case. And I feel like watching that video, you see her contradict that. Like she actually does speak to Augury in a pretty friendly manner. I'm so sorry about that. We got a little caught up in shopping. There's a bunch of cool stores in this city. I hope it's not a habit. Shopping? Oh, it definitely is. And I've gotten to the point where I think of that not as a contradiction, but in a difference between the way Ashling sees herself and the way that everyone else sees her. And she joined up with her current party, like, very quickly. She trusted that group way faster than I think she would want people to think. There's a few reasons for that, but I think the main one is just that Ashling, I'm kind of playing her like a teenager. Like she might think that she's really edgy and really hardened and, and like very self-sufficient, but in actuality, she's full of self-doubt and very scared and doesn't really know 
what she's like or, or what she wants or any of that stuff yet. And I don't know, I've been really enjoying playing that and, and playing her as sort of like an unreliable narrator in these videos where she speaks for herself. But I realize that a lot of that could be lost on the viewer because it requires context that I, I haven't necessarily given you. So I'm looking forward to finding some ways to expose the fact that she's an unreliable narrator in the videos that I make about her. And I actually wanted to read you some of the description that I wrote of Ashling before I had played her at all. Ashling has silvery white skin with brown markings like the bark of a birch tree. That would have been a lot of body paint. She has long pointed ears and her eyes have unsettling oversized black irises. I did actually wear circle lenses the first time I played Ashling and then they dried up. Her long, thick hair shifts from a vibrant new leaf green in the spring to a deep, rich green in the summer to a deep golden red in the fall and a dull brown in the winter, changed that, starting at the roots. There are leaves and flowers tangled into it or perhaps growing from it. I really did have this vision of her hair as being very wild and, and tangled and unkempt. The main reason why I haven't done that is just that I got that gorgeous green wig and I just didn't want to ruin it. It was so pretty. She has known starvation and suffering. She's eaten the raw bloodied bodies of rabbits and rats when it was too wet or risky to start a fire. She's pity killed fellow travelers when she knew their injuries could not be healed. She tends to leap to the most intense solution to any given problem. And I wrote a little note here to myself that says a little like Nebula from Guardians of the Galaxy. I've kept some of this, like she definitely still didn't grow up in comfort or anything, but I say here that she's killed people and yet in the Augury interview, the kill that I describe as her first kill is after she left the elves on her own. So that didn't line up. You know what's funny is that Nightshade is exactly as I described her here. Nothing about Nightshade has changed. She likes to eat bugs and enjoys swimming. She is naturally nocturnal and dislikes direct sunlight. All of those things have stayed with her. Anyway, I'm excited to answer some questions about Ashling today and just give you a little more insight into the character that she has grown into. And to be totally clear, I don't feel like Ashling is fully developed. There are a lot of questions that I don't know the answer to about her and there are still some things that I will probably change or, or iron out. So we're just gonna do a little bit of that today. Yes, my son? Whoa, wait a second. You're not Chaucer. Correct. I am not one of your little domesticated pets. I am one of the Catfolk, a noble race of warrior felines from the Southlands. What are the Southlands? Fool! Southlands is a 5th edition compatible setting, the subject of Kobold Press's latest Kickstarter and today's sponsor. There's a world book, a player's guide, and a collection of adventures titled after my home, the City of Cats. Oh right, I remember. Isn't it also available in print and PDF, including a hand-bound leather collector's edition and on Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds? Of course it is. There's even a Kickstarter exclusive, a print version of Tales Beneath the Sands, a collection of three additional tomb-crawling adventures. Which reminds me, I have to clean up my own cat's Tales Beneath the Sands later. Disgusting. Two questions. First, can you remind me where and how I can get Southlands? Sorry, I'm so forgetful. Unsurprising. Your human mind is weak and pitiful. That is why your kind needs felines to keep you in line. You can pledge on Kickstarter at the link in the description to obtain your copy. Awesome, thanks. Second question. Does your kind like chin scritches? Or is that considered rude? Hmm. I'll allow it. A little to the left. Okay, I'm gonna look at these questions. In a combat situation, which of your teammates do you think you synergize with best? Well, definitely not Alistair. I think the answer is probably Mimar, the Orc Barbarian. Alistair has a bad habit of accidentally doing damage to his teammates when he attacks at range. And then Bryn, the other rogue, is basically just like a, a one woman killing machine. Like she doesn't need anybody's help. She deals so much damage. But Mimar is like the perfect counterbalance to Ashling, I think, because Ashling is mostly operating from range and trying to disadvantage opponents. And Mimar is like up there actually in their face hitting them with a great axe. So when Ashling uses like fairy fire, it's Mimar who I think is reaping the biggest benefit from it. And because Mimar keeps the opponent like right in melee range, Ashling gets to stay back. And I mean, honestly, Ashling almost never gets hit in battle because she's just so far away. Especially because she can cast spells through Nightshade, her familiar. I'm doing a lot of blush because this is winter Ashling. So she's gonna be like, you know, she's gonna be in the snow. She's gonna be like kind of cold, pink nose. Too pink? Maybe. 
Do you have any regrets about starting adventuring? Unfortunately, I think Ashling has a lot of regrets. I've mentioned this before, but she basically left home and tried to stop this world ending rot explicitly against the direction of her patron. Her patron was basically like, listen, you cannot stop it. This is the end of the world. And Ashling was basically like, I don't accept that. I think that I'm super special and can beat this. And then she convinced other people to go with her and got them all killed. She's basically just like at the point of rebellious teenagerdom where she is sort of for the first time realizing the consequences of her actions. And a lot of what she's dealing with right now is just this rethinking of like how much she can trust herself and how confident she should actually be and whether or not her mistakes then become a danger to the people around her. Why did you decide to make a pact with your patron? This is such a good question. I honestly think that it's very lucky that Ashling ended up in a pact with Uir, who is very much like a chaotic neutral type of fae, instead of someone significantly more evil because she was, she was pretty easily lured into this pact. She was basically just doing like typical teen things, right? Like she was rebelling against the authority that was trying to control her. In this case, not just her adoptive mother, but more so the society in which she lived. Her elven society basically taught her that power was dangerous and ultimately would lead to the downfall of civilization. So when her patron showed up and was basically like, I can give you power, you can have the things you want. That's like the exact opposite of everything she had been told for her whole life. It was like the thing that she had been waiting for someone to say to her, basically. Neither she she nor I know what Uir, the woman of the soil, is like after. So it's entirely possible that she is evil. Who knows? That's really up to my DM. What is the scariest thing you've ever seen? <laughs> That's a great question because my DM loves making horror monsters. They are just like constantly reskinning monsters into something much more terrifying. I think arguably the scariest monster that we fought in that campaign was before Ashling. Some of you may remember that I very briefly played a homebrew robot monk before I played Ashling just for a few months. And when I was playing Petra, we encountered this it appeared to be like a slumped human form, but we could hear like singing. And as we got closer to it, this sort of like wraith ghoul thing rose up from behind the body and was like puppeteering the human corpse and attacking us with the human corpse. And the damage we did to the human corpse was like not damaging the wraith. And we had to figure out like how to damage this incorporeal creature that was like throwing this undead, unstoppable body at us. It was very spooky. But as far as things that Ashling herself has seen, I think the scariest thing would probably be that at one point we encountered like the skeleton of a large mammal that was being embodied by thousands of like white worms. Like it was moving and it was behaving like a creature, but it was because these like worms inside of it were manipulating it. As you can see, my DM is really into the idea of reanimating things in a horrible way. Favorite foods, least favorites? Is she more of a sweet, savory, sour, or salty type? Food is one of those indulgences that Ashling is just very into. Like she spent so many years of her life starving or eating like what she had to eat to survive that now when she has access to like a luxurious feast, she's gonna stuff herself until she is sick and like probably hide some of it in her pockets too. I feel like there's like two ways that not having a lot of money affects people. Either they become incredibly frugal and scrupulous even once they do have money, or they just immediately spend any money they have because they realize that it's fleeting and they wanna like reap all of the benefit out of it that they can. And Ashling is definitely the latter. She's gonna milk every ounce of enjoyment and comfort out of life that she can possibly get. How do you and Nightshade work in and out of combat? What is your relationship like? What is the coolest stunt she's pulled? I love Nightshade. I'm gonna be honest, one of the main reasons why I picked Warlock for Ashling is because I wanted to have a familiar. And I grew up reading Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern book, so the idea of having like a little pet tiny dragon has just really stuck with me. Ashling and Nightshade have a really close relationship that might not appear as close at first glance as it actually is, because Nightshade is really sassy. I've modeled Nightshade after sort of like the typical cliche idea of a cat. Aloof and doesn't quite let on that they love you and can be sort of vindictive if they're feeling wronged for some reason. So a lot of times if Ashling gives Nightshade a command, Nightshade will sort of push back and just be bratty about it. Although of course she will eventually do it because that's the rules. And unfortunately there have been multiple times where Ashling's choices and the situations that Ashling puts them in has resulted in Nightshade like suffering and or dying. I mean, since she's a familiar, she can just be resummoned. She just sort of gets dismissed out of this plane. But the idea in our game is that it is certainly 
physically uncomfortable to die. So Nightshade does not love when that happens and will usually give Ashling the silent treatment for like a good day afterwards. But one of the reasons that Awir gave Nightshade to Ashling is because Ashling was so alone. Like she just didn't really have anyone in the world that was on her side. And because of that, she and Nightshade have like an incredibly close bond because there are so many times that they've only had each other. And even though Ashling is starting to grow closer to the party and to trust them and to feel like part of that group, Nightshade is still the one that she can be 100% sure is always on her team. In combat, Ashling is usually hanging back and casting spells through Nightshade, so it's usually Nightshade who is actually in the fray of battle. But Nightshade herself doesn't really attack, her attacks are I mean, especially at, you know, what are we at now, level nine, her attacks are, are useless. But I would say that outside of just sort of like being the point through which Ashling casts spells, most of Nightshade's usefulness comes outside of combat. She's obviously incredibly useful as a scout. And then lately, because Ashling is a low level druid, so she can't actually turn into anything that can fly yet, but she can turn into like a spider and then sit on Nightshade's back and then Nightshade can fly her somewhere. So if they have to like cross over a gap or reach a high point, Ashling can usually get up there by wild shaping and then riding Nightshade. It's a pretty excessive use of wild shape, but it has come in handy occasionally. I definitely think Nightshade's best moment of glory was in this major boss battle that we had been building up to for months. It was with the leaders of this cult that we had been fighting like across the entire city. And I believe it's Bryn who was unconscious at this point. She had already been knocked down and there was an enemy advancing on her like ready to sort of deliver the killing blow. And none of us could get to her in time, but Nightshade was pretty close and I, basically just asked if Nightshade could like fly up and surprise the cultist and knock him backwards into the giant bonfire that was like right behind him. Obviously like a pseudo dragon knocking a human into a fire, that's not necessarily a kosher combat move. But my DM gave me the opportunity to roll. I think we did like intimidation or something, which is not the strong suit of a tiny little cute flower dragon. And just miraculously, I rolled really well and the cultist was down to his last few hit points and like fell backwards into the fire and died. And basically Nightshade like single-handedly saved Bryn's life. Sometimes I joke that the party just keeps Ashling around so that they can have Nightshade in the party. Okay, but how did you know to make tea out of your hair flowers? Was it just an accident and then you went with it? So there's, there's sort of this thing that I've developed with Ashling where she makes tea out of like the flowers and leaves that grow in her hair. I think that's extra funny in the context of winter or Ashling because Holly is poisonous? The berries, not the leaves. But I have a headcanon that nothing that grows in Ashling's hair is poisonous to her, but it could be poisonous to someone else, which might come up. It's not like she's spent a lot of time making tea for other people out of her own hair flowers, so she might not know that. My expectation is that she learned it the way that a lot of teenagers learn really stupid things, which is just that she was like bored and screwing around. Like at some point she was like, huh, out of tea. Wait a second. Who is Ashling's worst enemy? That's an interesting question because I feel like really Ashling's biggest vendetta is against the rot, which is not a being. I think at this point she's pretty used to having conflict with people, so I don't even know that she sees an enemy as like that big of a deal. I've played characters where like no one has ever disliked them in their life and the first time that they have an enemy, they're like, what? That is not Ashling. Like she just grew, she just grew up being disliked, which is probably why she has like a pretty blase attitude towards the enemies that her and her party have developed. Actually, you know what? I think she does have one and that is, there is a woman named One-Eyed Jill who literally bit Nightshade's head off at one point. If Nightshade gets like hurt in battle, I don't think Ashling is like, ah, uh, you know, I will kill you to take my revenge. But when someone intentionally, cruelly harms Nightshade, that is enough to create an enemy in Ashling. But yeah, as far as someone that she thinks of and is like, ah, I'm gonna get them, that's, it's that, it's one eye gel. What's a clothing style that you'd like to try? A dream one day aesthetic. So Ashling does care about fashion, but she also doesn't exactly understand it because she hasn't spent a lot of time in society that values fashion. If she sees like a rich person flouncing around in a ball gown, she will want a ball gown. I don't think that she has seen a ball gown at this point. I actually don't know how many people are really wearing ball gowns in this world in which we're playing, but if she saw 
one should be amped about it. All right, we've done it. It's time to put on the wig and put some holly in my hair. How many members of your party do you think you could defeat in an arm wrestling contest? I mean, like definitely Alistair, no question. I actually don't know what Alistair's strength is. It's possible that he has higher strength than her, but she would still believe that she could beat him. I feel like she could beat Bryn in a fair arm wrestling contest, but I doubt that Bryn would play a fair arm wrestling contest. And then Mimar, absolutely not. <laughs> She could bench press Ashling. This is my winter Ashling wig. I honestly don't love that it has black roots, but it was very hard to find a wig in the color that I wanted. What is your go-to spell? Which one is your favorite and why? I would definitely say that her go-to spell, the one that she casts the most is Fairy Fire. She just pretty much casts it at the beginning of almost every combat. But I don't know if it's her favorite. Fairy Fire is like a pretty passive spell. I would say that she enjoys phantasmal force the most, but it's very rare that it succeeds. But when it does, it's a lot of fun. Who is one person or creature you really miss? I think Ashling has very mixed and complicated feelings about her adoptive mother, Roisin. On the one hand, it's Roisin's reputation as like an outcast and a witch that led to Ashling growing up as an outcast herself. But on the other hand, she raised Ashling from, from when she was a baby and she taught her a lot of essential life skills and she wasn't cruel to her. She just maybe wasn't the ideal person to be a mother. And by this point she's dead. So I'm sure that there are plenty of times when Ashling misses her in her own like complicated way. I don't think I would say that Ashling misses her previous party. She didn't spend very much time with them. They were, they were more like a militia than a group of friends, I think from her perspective at least. Does she have any plans for what she's gonna do once she's done adventuring? That's a really hard one for Ashling to answer recently because she used to believe that she would be able to defeat the rot and that she would like go on to live a full life. But now that her first party was killed and she's sort of questioning whether or not she should have trusted what her patron said. And so some part of her thinks that it's entirely possible that the world might just end and she might not have a future at all. What was the moment that made you face your mortality and how did you handle it? So I know I keep coming back to this, but this really was like the most traumatic thing that Ashling has experienced. But when her whole party was killed and she was the only only one that survived. She only survived because she had been like captured and restrained and her new party happened upon her in that moment basically and were able to free her. So she saw all of her party members killed and was just fully aware of the fact that she was next. And the way she handled it was just that it was like that was the moment when she realized she was in way over her head. She was utterly terrified. She she just stopped thinking these like grandiose, oh, my patron says no one can do it, but I can do it. She stopped thinking those thoughts and realized like, oh shit, I'm mortal, I'm fallible. This could be the end of the line. She had an incredible amount of ego before that. In the way that I think a lot of like alternative edgy kids have that ego, like, oh, everyone else is one kind of way, but I am a better kind of way. Like I'm weird because I'm smarter and better than everyone else. This was like the moment of reckoning where she was like, oh, I'm not better than anybody. Like I will die just as easily as anyone else, which is obviously quite sobering. <laughs> Any advice on the care and feeding of a pseudo dragon? If Ashling met an actual pseudo dragon, I feel like she would, she would be surprised by it probably because her expectations would be around a fey familiar, which is different. If someone asked Ashling for advice on the care and feeding of a pseudo dragon, I mean, she would probably be wrong, but she would tell you that they don't actually need to eat much, but that they really like pickles and that they like to swim and that it's best to not wake them up during the day, if at all possible. When did you start leaning into druidic magic? So I didn't actually have much of an in-game decision point in terms of when Ashling multiclassed into druid. Instead, I'm treating it more like druidry just feels aligned with the way that Uir is as a patron and it feels aligned with the kind of magic that she would grant Ashling. So I'm viewing it more as the druidic magic is part of the boon of her patron. What's the worst thing you've ever tasted? Something that she ate out of necessity, probably like a raw uncooked animal of some kind or maybe, maybe some kind of bug. <laughs> Imagine some kind of like gross squiggly slug creature that just like writhes around underneath the surface level of leaves on the forest floor where it's all like damp and moldy, that kind of thing. She probably ate that kind of thing. Now I have to decide if I wanna add some of this random stick. I feel like it'd be interesting, right? Like, like this, like this. 
that interesting? It's a little closer to Ashling's roots as like an unkempt, tangled mess. Heh, <laughs> roots. Because <laughs> plants. <laughs> what are your feelings regarding money? She wants it. She knows that money is the path to get the things that she wants to have. So she wants to have it. That's kind of cool. I'm kind of into this. All right, so I am all set. It is now time to put on my corset and my little jacket and, and shoot some winter Ashling pictures. I hope this was fun. I certainly clarified some things about Ashling in my own mind just answering these questions. So thank you to everyone who gave me questions on Twitter. Don't forget if you want to get a winter Ashling postcard in the mail, make sure to pledge on my Patreon at the $5 tier or above between December 16th and 23rd? 16th and 23rd. I will put the link to my Patreon in the description or you can go to patreon.com slash D. I hope you have a happy whatever holidays you celebrate and if you don't celebrate them, I hope you have a great December.